welcome back. So, let us continue from where we left off uh, in the last lecture, but before that a quick review, quick recap of what we have done so far. In, uh, in the last lecture, I introduced the concept of preference shares and explained the relevance of preference shares, uh, why they are called preference shares, because they have a preferential right as to the payment of dividend and as to the re repayment of capital in the event of liquidation of the company. Uh, then uh, I explained the, the uh, why we call preference shares the rational behind calling preference shares as hybrid instruments. Uh, I explained the debt related features of preference shares. Uh, they usually carry a fixed rate of dividend. Uh, they have preemptive rights just like the rights of lenders over equity shareholders in so far as payment of uh, returns that is dividend or interest as the case may be and also uh, rights in respect of the repayment of capital in the event of winding up of the company. Uh, then uh, preference shares have no voting rights in the normal course uh, as in the case of debt instruments. However, of course, if the preference dividend is in arrears for 2 years or more, then the preference shareholders get a right under section 47 of the uh, 2013 Companies Act to vote on resolutions uh, on which equity shareholders are entitled to vote. Mm, if the equity related features of preference shares, well dividend on preference shares is discretionary. This is a very important feature, it is an appropriation of profits and therefore, you do not get any tax shield on dividends. And secondly, the important feature is that uh, a dividend is not a charge against the profits, uh, pretty much similar to equity dividend in the context of uh, this particular property. Then we discuss the pro, uh, types of preference shares, we discuss cumulative and uh, non-cumulative preference shares, convertible and non-convertible preference shares which uh, can be converted to equity shares as per the terms of issue. Uh, uh, cumulative preference shares incidentally are those shares on which if dividend of a particular year is not paid then that is carried forward to the subsequent years. In other, in other words, the arrears of dividend are not extinguished in the year to which they relate, but they get carried forward. We talked about redeemable preference shares and irredeemable preference shares. We also discussed the rational behind the abolition of uh, the issue of irredeemable preference shares in our country in India. Uh, we also discussed participating and non-participating preference shares, participating preference shares being those uh, that are entitled to participate in the profits of the company and the resources of the company in the event of winding up over and above the fixed rate of recovery of their dividend and paid up capital as the case may be. In other words, they become part of the, uh, of the kitty that belongs to the equity shareholders in the event of uh, payment and declaration of uh, dividends as well as uh, uh, redemption of capital winding up of the company. Callable preference shares are shares which can be <coughs> called up by the issuer uh, as per the terms of issue uh, at the discretion of the issuer that is why they are called call a, callable. Call a, on the call ability property relates to the call option property which is the right to buy an asset. Uh, callable preference shares accordingly carry a right uh, on behalf of the issuer or uh, to exercise that right and call back the capital at its discretion. So, they are, they are called callable preference shares. Uh, why irredeemable preference shares were not uh, were uh, are not allowed rather to be issued uh, to the public in India? Well, this, this uh, issue was examined by the Sachar committee and it was felt that because such preference shares do not provide an exit route to the investors in the event of the company being in bad shape and uh, moreover the returns on those shares may be completely cut off from the environment in which they, uh, they relate that is the market risk uh, premium and so on. And as a result of which it was decided that uh, these shares keeping in view the level of literacy uh, uh, in so far as financial literacy is concerned that presents itself in our country, uh, these shares should not be allowed to be uh, issued by corporates. In treatment of preference shares, if the preference shares uh, carry a fixed rate of dividend and or if the preference shares uh, 
have a fixed maturity, then they are to be considered as part of liabilities as per the IFRS provisions. And if uh, these uh, conditions are not a part of the issue, then they would be treated as part of equity. Then we discussed the difference between warrants and options. Uh, warrants are sweeteners that are usually attached either, either to the issue of preference shares or to the issue of debentures by a company, which uh, these instruments are tradable parts of the, of the uh, primary instrument and uh, they can be traded in their own rights. And uh, these instruments uh, entitle the holder of the instrument to uh, buy an equity share or one or more equity shares in the company at uh, terms that are specified in the issue document the, at a price which is called the excess price and on or before a date which is called the expiry date. So, warrants are uh, instruments which are issued by the company itself by the issuer company and uh, they entitle the holder of the warrant to uh, subscribe to uh, the equity shares of the company at the excess price and on uh, terms. Uh, as to uh, the maturity as to the expiry which are contained in the issue documents. Uh, as far as options are concerned, options are tradable contracts which are usually uh, traded on appropriate derivative exchanges and uh, they are issued by the re relevant exchange for trading, they are released for trading by the relevant exchange and they really do not have anything to do with the issuer company of the underlying asset. Uh, so, that is the fundamental difference between uh, warrants and options that we discussed in the last lecture. Then we moved on to risk and arbitrage, uh, we defined risk in terms of uncertainty and we agreed that if there is a uh, if there is an instrument which guarantees uh, uh, the repayment uh, of a certain amount which guarantees a certain value at a future date then obviously there is no risk attached to that investment if the guarantee is uh, infallible if the guarantee uh, cannot be uh, if the guarantee will not be uh, defaulted upon and uh, Therefore, uh, we said that if there is absolute certainty as to the value of the or the final value of our investment, then there is no risk. Uh, 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 putting it in other words, what one could say that uh, risk arises from the uncertainty in the future value of a uh, investment. If the investment can take two or more values at the future date, then that results in the uh, risk in the mind of the investor at the point of investment. So, risk was uh, treated as synonymous with uh, uh, uncertainty and then we said that uh, it is only when the value of the uh, when the value of the uh, investment on the date of maturity or the final value of the investment fluctuates uh, has the possibility of fluctuating between two or more values uh, that risk uh, uncertainty is there and therefore, risk is there. So, the proper um, pro process is that fluctuations uh, in the final value of an investment uh, result in the creation of uncertainty as to which value the investment would take on, on its maturity and which results in a risk in the mind of the investor, creation of risk in the mind of the investor. So, that is the flow that uh, normally takes place, the fluctuations result in uncertainty, fluctuations or the possibility of fluctuation between different values of the asset result in uncertainty and uncertainty results in a risk in the mind of investors. Then uh, we discussed an important property that the worst possible, the worst possible future value of a risky asset must necessarily be less than the uh, corresponding value of a risk free asset. So, uh, what essentially it means is that if the, if there is a risk free asset trading in the market and there is a risky asset trading in the market, then the worst possible outcome uh, of the risky asset must necessarily be worse than the outcome of the risk free asset. I repeat, if there are assets, uh, two assets trading in the market, one is a risk free asset and the other is a risky asset, then the worst possible value that the risky asset can take must be less than the value that the risk free asset can take. 
that is dictated by the grounds of or by the requirements of arbitrage which we shall talk about. Um, then we discussed the relationship between risk and uh, deviations, risk and amplitudes and we agreed that greater is the amplitude of fluctuations, greater is the deviation of the uh, of future value of the asset from the mean value, greater is the risk embedded in the particular investment. And similarly, we talked about probabilities. The, uh, probabilities also do have a strong say, have a massive say in the riskiness of uh, assets. For example, we discussed two bonds X and Y. Bond X had a 99, 90% probability of uh, success and uh, a 10% default probability. Bond Y had a 5% default probability. So, it was obvious at the outset that bond X is more risky than bond Y. Both these properties, the properties of the amplitudes as well as the probabilities of the occurrence of those amplitudes, occurrence of those deviations are captured by the probability distribution of the uh, values of the, of the asset or the investment or the, uh, in its final state. So, we, we said that uh, it is basically the probability distribution of the values of the of the asset on the uh, on the final date or on the future date uh, of the investment that would determine the riskiness of the asset and uh, whenever we talk about probabilities as i mentioned there are certain probability distributions which are entirely captured by the the expected value and the variance for example the gaussian distribution but there are in any case the expected value and variance of a distribution gives us significant information about the dip, uh, about the distribution uh, in it ca captures uh, to a large extent the essence of the distribution the first and the second movements of the distribution and then we discussed the issue of riskiness uh, price and return and we agreed that uh, the uh, given uh, three assets uh, which have the same final value, but the uh, default, but with different default probabilities, one being a risk free asset, the second being a low risk asset and the third being a high risk asset with a higher default probability. The asset that has the uh, least risk would be traded at the highest price and the asset that has the maximum risk of default would be traded at the lowest price. Putting it the other way around, if the, there are three assets which are being traded at the same price, then naturally the future value of the least risky asset would be lower and the future value of the most risky asset would be the maximum. In other words, the expected return uh, would be a function of risk and the most risky asset would give you the highest expected return and the least risky asset uh, or the risk free asset would give you the lowest return. Uh, this was depicted in this diagram which we discussed uh, in the last lecture. Therefore, what the outcome was that uh, increased riskiness results in increased return, but that increased return is on the average. I emphasize this point strongly once again. I emphasize it again that we are talking about expected returns. We are not talking about real returns. And uh, increased riskiness means ex increased expected returns, but at the same time because the asset is more risky, there is a greater possibility of non-achievement of that expected return. So, that is the important part we need to look at the higher expected return in conjunction with the riskiness of uh, attaining or achieving that particular return. Now, uh, again uh, putting it the other way around, putting all the things in the other way around, what we find is that if there are uh, three assets having the same maturity value and different levels of risk, then the asset that is uh, having the least risk or the risk free asset as the case may be would be traded at the uh, highest price. In other words, the discount rate would be the lowest in the case of the risk free asset and the discount rate would be the highest in the case of the risky asset. Thus, we can conclude that the discount rate that we use for discounting future values to present values or from future values uh, from one future date to another future date uh, will is a function of the riskiness of the asset and uh, it very much varies with the uh, riskiness of the asset. Higher the riskiness of the asset, higher is the discount rate that we would use for, uh, for coming to the present value of the asset. Then we moved on to arbitrage and we introduced the concept of one price, the law of one price and we said that in the absence of confounding factors like liquidity, financing, taxes, credit risk and so on, identical sets of cash flows would sell at 
the same price. Identical sets of cash flows, I emphasize that we are talking about cash flows, we are not talking about profitability. The reason um, we shall talk about later on, but for the moment we are basic, uh, we need to uh, take note of this fact that uh, we are talking about identical sets of cash flows and uh, not identical sets of profitability. So, identical sets of cash flows should sell at the same price. Then we discussed this diagram of arbitrage and we agreed that um, for example, if we have asset B A and asset B, asset A is providing you a higher return, higher expected return compared to asset B for the same level of risk and therefore, it, this would not be sustainable in equilibrium. And, uh, people would sell off asset B, people would buy asset A that would increase demand for A, that would decrease demand for B and uh, resulting in the price of A increasing, the price of B decreasing and therefore, the return on A decreasing and the return of B increasing until they converge. Similar situation with, will be with asset C and D, but we cannot say much about assets A and D because asset A has a higher return. I am sorry, asset B and D. Uh, asset B has a lower return than asset D, but then asset B also has a lower risk than asset D. I repeat, if you look at asset B and D, we cannot say much about the, them because here the risk return trade off of the market player, the risk return trade off of the participant would come into play how much risk he wants to, uh, to take up, how much incremental risk he is willing to take up. For, an, uh, for a unit of incremental return or vice versa. So, here we because we are in, uh, we are not aware of the risk return trade offs of investors, we cannot say much about the relationship between asset B and D. Uh, uh, asset B has a lower expected return and a lower risk, asset D has a higher expected return and a higher risk than B and therefore, uh, the issue of risk return trade off comes into play. And this is an interesting observation. Uh, here I have shifted the origin from the previous uh, um, uh, figure, from this figure I have shifted the origin to the to the um, security B. And uh, what I find is that uh, as far as those securities are concerned which lie either on the axis, either on the axis or lie in the second quadrant or the fourth quadrant arbitrage is possible. For example, if you look at asset C, asset C has a higher expected return and a lower level of risk compared to asset B and therefore, arbitrage between B and C would take place. Similar is the case uh, between the asset B and the uh, and the asset that lies in the fourth quadrant, because this asset in the fourth quadrant higher risk then B and a lower expected return then B. Therefore, again arbitrage would take place between B and this particular asset. However, for those assets which lie in the first quadrant and which lie in the fourth quadrant, arbitrage is unlikely to happen. Because if you look again, if you look at assets B and D, uh, their uh, uh, arbitrage would not happen as I explained just now. Now, in, in discussing the theory of arbitrage, I have not alluded much <coughs> if at all to the issue of interaction between securities. I have been very much talking about the securities on standalone standalone basis, uh, the in issue of interaction between securities has not been addressed. Uh, it is true that at the macro level when we talk about uh, the security prices, they would incorporate information about mutual interactions between the securities. Uh, and therefore, probably the theory that uh, we are, I have uh, propounded so far would very much hold even in the presence of in interactions. But uh, at a micro level, I need to emphasize that there may be situations uh, and there may be strong situations where uh, uh, an investment may prima facie will not be justified uh, on a standalone basis, but uh, because it contributes uh, effectively the portfolio of securities of the investor in a positive manner, uh, the investor may be willing to take up that security at a price which is not justified by the market conditions. For example, uh, I would like to venture to the extent of saying that there may be situations where a security with a negative return 
could be invested in by, a, by an investor because the introduction of that security into his existing portfolio may result in significant reduction in risk. But this is very much at the micro level. At the ma macro level, one may expect that the securities prices uh, incorporate information about mutual interactions as well. Now, we look at certain uh, uh, examples of arbitrage, we take a closer look at the examples of arbitrage to make the, uh, the uh, exposition absolutely crystal clear. Uh, let us look at the case of two assets X and Y uh, and uh, uh, there are two sta possible states of nature at a future date, I simply named them as alpha and beta, they could be anything, uh, they could be a boon, they could, it could be one of them could be a boon, the other could be a recession, one could be high rainfall, the other could be low rainfall, whatever the case may be. Uh, as a general uh, nomenclature, I have named them as alpha and beta. Uh, both the assets X and Y are priced at 100 at T equal to 0 as of today. And as on, uh, as on the end of the uh, uh, horizon, investment horizon of the investor, uh, if uh, the state alpha materializes, both of the assets give a zero payoff. And if the state of nature beta materializes on the date of uh, the uh, investment horizon, end of the investment horizon, then, uh, then uh, asset X is going to give you 110 and asset Y is giving to going to give you 120. So, in the two possible states of nature alpha and beta, uh, if alpha materializes there is zero payoff from both the contracts or both the uh, investments and there is a payoff of 110 versus 120 in case the state of nature beta materializes. If both the assets are being priced at 100, then it is quite natural that there would be arbitrage between them and th therefore, this we can safely conclude that in this sort of scenario arbitrage will operate, the price of A will decline, the price of B will increase until they achieve equilibrium returns. Let us talk about portfolio P and Q. Now, portfolio P and Q, uh, portfolio 2 I am sorry, let us talk about portfolio 2 uh, comprising of assets P and asset Q. Now, this is very interesting, uh, both of them are priced at 100 and uh, L, if the state alpha materializes, state of nature alpha materializes, uh, the asset P gives you 0, the asset Q gives you 10 in units of money, whatever the unit of money may be. Uh, if the state beta materializes, then you get 100 on asset P and 0 on asset Q. Prima facie, it may seem that asset P is definitely superior because it has a payoff of 100 if the, uh, the state beta materializes, but a closer look uh, reveals otherwise. Um, in this situation, it is really not uh, unambiguously correct that asset P is the superior asset. Why? Why? Uh, we cannot say so. Why we cannot say that asset P is superior? For example, let us take the situation where the probability of happening of state alpha has been estimated as uh, 99.99 percent to 0 0.9999, and the happening of state beta is uh, is uh, carries a probability of 0 0.001. What happens in that situation? Uh, uh, clearly, the expected value of Q turns out to be higher than the expected value of P. So, until and unless we have further information about the occurrences of state alpha and state beta, we cannot prima facie conclude that just because the payoff of, uh, uh, of uh, asset P is higher in one of the states, uh, uh, there should be arbitrage between P and Q and the relative prices should change. Uh, it is quite likely that the current market prices actually reflect the re relative probabilities of the occurrence of uh, state alpha and state beta and therefore account for the differential payoff in the two states. Let us look at some more uh, uh, examples. Uh, let us look at portfolio 3. Portfolio 3 involves asset A and asset B. Uh, the, pri no, uh, the prices are open. Uh, uh, the price of asset A I have represented by P A, the price of asset B I have represented at P B at T equal to 0. Again, we have two states of nature alpha and beta. The asset A gives you 0 
a if alpha state materializes and 100 if beta state materializes. Uh, asset B is uh, giving you 90 in both the states, 90 if al state alpha materializes, 90 if state beta materializes. Prime of SI there seems to be no connection between P A and P B and we cannot say much about uh, uh, if anything about the possibility of arbitrage between A and B uh, because again the payoffs are not. Uh, um, not uh, 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 clearly dominant in favor of either of A or B. Because if you look at asset B, asset A, it is giving you a higher payoff in beta state, and if you look at asset B, it is giving you a higher payoff in alpha state. But they, you can arrive at some conclusion uh, about the relationship between P, A, and B indirectly. Uh, let us say we introduce a risk free asset into our problem. We introduce a risk free uh, investment at uh, t equal to 0 in a risk free asset equal to the present value of 10 uh, computed at the risk free rate naturally. So, what would be the payoffs in that case? In that case, the payoff a of A would remain unchanged at 0 and 100, and in the asset B or together with asset B, we have a uh, investment in the risk free asset of an amount equal to the present value of 10. And this uh, investment in, in the risk free asset when liquidated on the date of maturity of the investment would give you 10 units of money and therefore, the total payoff from B plus the risk free investment turns out to be 100 if the state alpha materializes and 100 if the state beta materializes. So, now it is quite clear that uh, the, uh, the portfolio comprising of asset B and the risk free asset is definitely superior to the portfolio comprising of asset A alone and therefore, we must have P B plus the present value of 10 is greater than P A. P B plus the present value of 10 is greater than P A. So, this is uh, some information or some bounds at least that we can derive from this particular portfolio, uh, portfolio 3. Similarly, we can uh, work uh, out the bounds in respect of portfolio 4, which comprises of again two assets A and B priced at P A and P B. A is giving you 90 and 100 in the two states alpha and beta, B is giving you 100 and 90 in the two states uh, alpha and beta. Prime of SI again, I must emphasize that there is uh, no information which enables us to take up arbitrage exercises in this particular portfolio as well. However, we can work in the same manner in which we did uh, in the case of portfolio 3 and we can arrive at bounds for P B and P A. P B must lie between P A minus present value of 10 and P A plus present value of 10 and by symmetry we can have the we get the same bounds for P A as well. So, and this I leave as an exercise, it is absolutely similar to the portfolio 3 that I discussed just now. So, let us recap the fundamental issues relating to arbitrage. A set of transactions can be classified as arbitrage if and only if either the risk remains unchanged or the return remains unchanged. If the risk remains unchanged or the return remains unchanged. If both risk and return change as it happened between the, the asset B and the asset D in our diagram, uh, the issue of risk return trade off will crop up and therefore, we cannot unambiguously conclude that there is an arbitrage opportunity. Now, there is another important point that I must emphasize that there is no limit to the number of transactions that can be entered into for arbitrage. For example, uh, a typical example you could convert uh, INR into dollars, dollars into uh, uh, sterling and sterling back into INR. It is not necessarily uh, true that we must confine arbitrage to two, uh, two assets, uh, let us say uh, rupee and dollar and then reconversion uh, of uh, dollar to rupee. That is not at all necessary. We can have as many transactions as we like. For example, uh, not only uh, three points, we can have even more point arbitrage, two point arbitrage, three point arbitrage, n point arbitrage. But the problem is that uh, as the number of uh, uh, transactions constituting the arbitrage increases, the 
frictional cost that is the the uh, the cost of uh, buying and selling or uh, the broker's commission and so on uh, that are actually in, incurred in the market uh, uh, tend to eat away into the arbitrage profits. So, more the number of transactions greater is going to be this frictional costs uh, uh, that are uh, absolutely there in the real markets and as a result of which the profits may be less. Now, there uh, uh, important definition because we are going to use this in the pricing of uh, 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 number of assets that we are going to uh, discuss uh, bonds as well as uh, derivatives. Our portfolio is said to be an arbitrage portfolio. If today is a, it is of non positive value, today it is of non positive value and in the future it has 0 probability of being of negative value and a non zero probability of being a positive value. In other words, today it has a non positive value that is uh, it is a cash outflow either it has a zero value or it is a cash outflow, but in the future point in time when uh, at any point in time in the future it has a zero probability of being of negative value that uh, that means, uh, negative value implies a possibility of cash outflow, but a non zero probability but a non-zero probability of having a positive value. In other words, there is a possibility of a positive cash flow and there is no possibility of a negative cash flow in future then it is called an arbitrage par portfolio. Now, let us uh, there are three simple theorems. Um, if portfolio A and portfolio B are such that in every possible state of the market at time t capital T that is the end of the investment horizon, portfolio A is worth at least as much as portfolio B and portfolio A is worth more than portfolio B in some states of the world. This is, so, what does it say? He says that in every state of nature that could possibly occur on the date of maturity of the investment, portfolio A is worth at least as much as portfolio B, but there is at least one state in which portfolio A is worth more than portfolio B. So, in all states A must be at least equal to B and at least some state must, uh, uh, must be there in which the value of A exceeds the value of B, then what happens that in at any previous time, at any previous time portfolio A is worth more than portfolio B, portfolio A is worth more than portfolio B. Uh, I established this theorem by an example, again let us consider uh, two states of nature state alpha and state beta. We have we long portfolio A, so that costs us P A, it is a cash outflow, so we write it as minus P A, we short portfolio B and because shorting results in the in the inflow of cash, so we uh, take plus P B. Now, let us assume that in the state alpha, uh, the portfolio A gives me 10, the portfolio G B gives me 0 and in the state beta, the portfolio uh, a gives me 100, the portfolio B gives me 100. In other words, uh, in the state alpha, there in both the states alpha and beta, uh, portfolio B is junior to portfolio A is superior to uh, is at least more than or equal to portfolio B and there is one state alpha in which portfolio A is uh, superior to portfolio B. Let me repeat. The, in both the states portfolio A is as good at least as good as portfolio B, uh, but there is one state alpha in which portfolio A is superior to portfolio B. Now, please note this minus sign here uh, in the uh, beta column of portfolio B because please note we are short in portfolio B and because we are short in portfolio B, so the payoff would be negative uh, of, uh, of whatever the uh, actual payoff on the portfolio is and therefore, we write it as minus 100. So, uh, the net result of combining these two portfolios long portfolio A and short portfolio B is that we get a port, uh, payoff of 10 if alpha state happens and a, port, a payoff of 0 if beta state happens. Clearly, this is a non-negative uh, 
payoff the payoff is either 0 in one state or positive in the other state and therefore, the, the cost of establishing this portfolio must be positive. In other words, there should be a cash outflow at t equal to 0 for establishing this portfolio. Therefore, p b minus a should be negative. Thank you. We will continue after the break.